In this video, we're going to discuss the disjunction symbol, which is the wedge, and its semantics, that is, what it means in FOL. Let's take a look at it. All right, so as we were saying, the disjunction symbol is that symbol, the wedge, and when you have a sentence in FOL that's employing it, it reads as or. The other way of reading it is either or. So if we take this sentence, for instance, that reads in one of two ways. <clears throat> a is a cube or A is a tetrahedron. The other way is either A is a cube or A is a tetrahedron. So the disjunction symbol in FOL can cause students um, some confusion, unfortunately, and that's because in the ordinary English um, usage of or, or either or, we sometimes use it in an inclusive sense, and sometimes we use it in an exclusive sense. So when we are using it in the exclusive sense, what we're saying is you can um, either this option is true or this other option is true, but not both. So it's one or the other. But in the um, inclusive sense, it's one or the other or both. So if we take a look at this exclusive example first, you can imagine a parent saying to her child that you can have the cookies or the ice cream. And what the parent is saying is you can have the cookies or you can have the ice cream, but you can't have both the cookies or the ice cream. If it was the inclusive sense, then maybe the child would say, sweet, I'll take both. But that's not what the parent means to be suggesting. Just one or the other, but not both. Um, in the inclusive sense, we have an example here. You can imagine, say, in a newspaper at well, newspaper, uh, you can imagine looking for a job on the internet, and you have uh, a job, job advertisement that says the job candidate must have two years experience with C++ or must be certified in it. And if you're somebody who has both um, two years experience with C++ and you're certified in it, you're actually a better candidate than somebody that just has one or the other. So surely uh, when somebody says this, says have two years experience with C++ or be certified in it, they're, they don't mean to be excluding the situation in which um, you have both of those. That is still acceptable. You could still get the job in that case. Significantly or importantly to know in FOL, we always use the disjunction in the inclusive sense. So we treat it as being true when one of the option is true, when the other option is true, or when both options are true. We still count it to be true. So don't get confused and accidentally interpret it in the exclusive sense. That'll get you in trouble. That will get you um, to get some of your homework exercises wrong. So don't do that. <clears throat> All right, so how does the disjunction symbol connect sentences? Like the conjunction symbol, the disjunction symbol connects sentences by occurring between the sentences that are being connected. Uh, in this first example here, we have two atomic sentences being connected. A is a cube is being connected. B is a cube is being connected to form the complex sentence that is a disjunction 
and that reads either A is a cube or B is a cube. Now we have a more complex sentence and we have one disjunction that is a disjunct of a larger disjunction and we have another disjunct that is an, a negation and since this wedge is in between them these are the sentences that are being connected so it's saying either that left sentence in the circle is true or that right sentence or the sentence to the right of the wedge is true or both of them is true since it's the inclusive sense all right and this sentence is itself a disjunction where that's one a is a cube is one disjunct and then not the case that a is a large is another disjunct because they are being connected by this wedge <clears throat> and that's saying that either a is a cube is true or it's not the case that a is large is true or both of those sentences are true so how do we read a, a much more complex sentence such as that in FOL? Well, in the same way with the conjunction, we had to use the both and locution to let the uh, person who's listening to us know how it's structured, know where those parentheses are supposed to go. Uh, we have to use the either or locution to do that here. So for that first parentheses, we want to say either, and we want to stress it to let the listener know that that's the larger disjunction in question. And we want to say or here, and it's going to be stressed again. But we also need to say either at that parentheses and say or at this wedge. So the way you would read this is, uh, something as the following, either either A is a cube, or it's not the case that A is large, <clears throat> or um, it's not the case that A is small. All right, so the disjunction symbol in FOL connects FOS, FOL sentences differently than how the disjunction in ordinary English connects sentences, at least oftentimes. So an example would be here where we see that the disjunction or is being placed in between the nouns of the sentences as opposed as opposed to connecting two separate clauses um, in FOL the way that we would have to write this is to write out the full atomic sentence that A is a cube and the full atomic sentence B is a cube, and then connect it with the, junk, the disjunction in between. <clears throat> what we could not do, what would be grammatically incorrect and just gibberish, would be to write the following. <clears throat> that is grammatically incorrect in FOL. That does not say that either A is a cube or B is a cube. You have to write out the full sentence, the full sentences and then put the disjunction symbol in between them. Um, and here we have C is large or C is a cube. So again, you couldn't say something like this. That won't make sense in FOL. It's grammatically incorrect. You know, it's like throwing just a, a bunch of random English words together. Um, soap the and forever, blah blah blah. It's just a, a string of a string of symbols that, when thrown together, doesn't make sense. That's what this would be. Instead. have to write it like 
this. All right, so let's turn to discussing the semantics of disjunction. So what does the disjunction symbol mean in FOL? Um, so we say that a sentence, uh, either P or Q in FOL, is true if and only if at least one of P or Q is true. So at least one of them. So that means um, P or Q in FOL is false if and only if both P and Q are false, only in that one situation. And that's represented in this truth table below. So each of our rows represents the situation. Uh, situation one represents a case in which P turns out to be true and Q turns out to be true since at least one of uh, P or Q is true, because they're both true, then we get true as an output for our disjunction in FOL. Since at least one is true in case two, namely P, we get true as an output for our disjunction in FOL. And since in case three, at least one of our disjunctions true and the Q, we output true for disjunction in FOL. But since neither P nor Q is true in case four, it outputs um, false for us. So again, this, this uh, gives us a way of talking about the inclusive sense of the disjunction yet again. Notice it's true in the case where one of them is true. It's true in the case when the other is true. And it's true in the case when both are true. Right? So uh, let's elaborate on the meaning of disjunction by looking at um, slightly more complex sentences. All right, so in this sentence we have a disjunction in which our left disjunct is um, represented as an atomic sentence, and our right disjunct is a negation. And that means that in order to determine the truth conditions for this disjunction, we first have to figure out the truth conditions for this disjunct, since it's a complex sentence. So we have to work our way from the inside out, as it were. And that has to do with the truth functionality uh, of our connections. Okay. So what that means is we got to think about what the semantics of negation is, since that's where we have to start. And since what a negation tells us is the sentence being negated is false, then that's right when the sentence being negated is false. That's when we would give it true. So we flip from the truth value false to true. But when we say of something that it's false when it's actually true, that's when we're wrong. So we would flip from the value of the sentence being true to false. So for example, here in situation one, Q is actually true. But worse here, this sentence, um, not the case Q is saying that it's false in this case. So we're wrong. And since we're wrong, we give ourselves the value false. In situation two, Q is false. And since we're saying that Q is false in situation um, two, at least the right disjunct is saying that, then it comes out with the value true. Case three, Q is actually true, but the right disjunct is saying that it's false, so it's wrong. Q is false in situation four. Um, the right disjunct is saying that it is false, so it's right, so it gets the value true. So it just switches the truth value in each case. So Q turned into false, 
false turned into true, true turned into false, false turned into true. Okay. Now that we've determined that, let's go ahead and just refill the key area so that we don't have to keep looking at the reference column. So we're just repeating what P actually says. So true, true, false, false. And our semantics of disjunction tells us that a disjunction is true if and only if at least one of its disjuncts is true. That's what this is saying. Okay. So in our first situation, we see that at least one of our disjuncts is true, so that gets true. Uh, in situation two, we see that at least one of our disjuncts is true, so it gets the value true. In situation three, neither of our disjuncts is true, so it gets the value false. And then in 4, we see that at least one of our disjuncts is true, so it gets the value true. So for this sentence, that is its truth conditions. All right, let's look at one more sentence using the truth tables to understand the semantics of disjunction. And this time we have a complex uh, disjunction. All right, let's look at one last sentence while thinking about the semantics of disjunction using truth tables. And here we have a disjunction where the left disjunct is a complex sentence, um, namely a conjunction, and the right disjunct is an atomic sentence. Since the left disjunct is a complex sentence, that means we're going to have to figure out its truth conditions before we can figure out the disjunction's truth conditions. But the conjunction um, takes for its right con conjunct as a negation. So then we're going to have to figure out the truth conditions of that negation before we can figure out the truth conditions of that conjunction. So again, we have to work from the inside out um, to get the truth conditions properly, to figure them out properly. All right. So we know that for um, this sentence, we just put the truth value of what we have here, since it, that's what the negation tells us to do. So it's false, true, false, true. Let's just go ahead and repeat the P next to it so that we don't have to keep looking over to the reference column. It would be true, true, false, false. And if you'll remember the semantics of a conjunction is it's true, a, a conjunction is true if and only if all of its conjuncts are true. So for any case in which at least one of them is false, it gets the value false. And only in the case in which all of them are true does it get the value true. Well, we have one false here, so we know it's false. We have no false here, so we know it's true. We have two of them false here, so we know it's false in case three, in situation three. And we have one false here, so we know it's false in that case. All right, so that is the truth condition for are left of disjunct. Okay? Again, let's just repeat this for the P for our right disjunct. P, P, F, F. And since this disjunction symbol is connecting this sentence, this conjunction 
in this atomic sentence, those are the ones we now input to figure out what's going to be outputted for um, that disjunction symbol. So it's going to be the two purple columns. All right, we said that a disjunction is true when at least one of its disjuncts is true. So we notice that one of our disjuncts is true in this case, so this will get the value t. We see that at least one of our disjuncts is true in that case, so it gets the value t. Um, neither of our disjuncts are true in case 3, so it gets the value f, and neither of them are true in the fourth case, so it gets the value f. And so this ends up being the two conditions of that complex sentence of the disjunction that we were doing the table for. All right, so let's turn to using the Hintica game as a way of thinking about the semantics of disjunctions in FOL. And here's what the Hintica game has to say about it. If you commit yourself to the disjunction P or Q in FOL, then you commit yourself to at least one of P or Q to be true. So again, it's at least one. Could be both, but at least one. If you commit yourself to P or Q in FOL to be false, then you commit yourself to both P and Q being false. All right, let's uh, look how this works in Tarski's world. All right, let's look at this first sentence here that says that either A is a cube or A is large. To play the game, we come to this button, hit play game, and it wants us to choose our initial commitment. Do we think that statement is true or do we think that it's false? Well, let's say we think it's true. So then it double checks. Do you believe that either A is a cube or A is large? Sure. So since for a disjunction to be true, at least one of its disjuncts needs to be true, it asks, so you believe that at least one of these formulae is true? And I'm going to say, yeah. So now I'm going to pick the one that I think is true. Ah, you know what? I think A is a cube. So I believe that A is a cube is true, double check, true. But that's false, because if I look over here into the world, I see that A is actually a dodecahedron, not a cube. Oh, okay, maybe where I went wrong then was choosing the wrong one. So let's say I still say that it's true, and now I'm going to pick large, I think. Oh, the reason why I think this is true is because A is large. Double checks with us. But again, I lose because I come over here and I see that um, A is actually small. It's not large. Um, neither of the disjuncts is true, so it turns out that this disjunction is false. So again, the, the Hitika game resolves our commitments down. Uh, it, it goes through the various commitments by resolving the sentence in question down into its most basic commitments. And that way we can see, uh, if, if we're not understanding the meaning of a sentence, it can help us see where we're going wrong with the meaning. All right, let's go back. And now let's see this negation of a disjunction. So this says that the disjunction, um, either A is a cube or A is large, is false. So that's what it's asserting. It's asserting that's not the case. So we come up here to play the game. And let's say, you know what? I think that's true. I think it's true that it's not the case that at least one of those is true. It's not the case that either A is a cube is true or that A is large is true. So it tells me, okay, so you think then it takes off the negation symbol because that just means I'm saying that it's false. And then it just states that. Oh, so you think that this sentence, if 
is false. Yes, that's what I was saying. Oh, okay, so I think both of these formulae are false because I'm saying there's not even at least one of them. So not even one of them is true is the commitment that I've made. And I say, yeah, and what Tarski world will try to do is prove me wrong by picking one that's true. Uh, yes, I do believe that A is a cube is a false statement. I win. It could not find one that was false. So that lets me know that the original statement, in fact, is true, since that was our original commitment. All right, so the last thing to talk about is different ways of translating two standard ways of translating neither nor. So neither P nor Q. If I say neither P nor Q, then what I'm saying is P is false, and I'm saying Q is false. That's what I'm committing myself to when I say neither this nor that, neither P nor Q. Well, it's pretty clear, just by the symbols employed, that this statement here is asserting something that means the very same thing as neither nor. Because it's saying both, because of the conjunction, right? It's saying both P is false and Q is false because the negation being attached to P is just saying is asserting that P is false, and the negation that's attached to Q is just asserting that it's false. So that's saying the same thing as neither nor. You can actually also say neither nor this way. It turns out it means these two mean the very same thing. But in this case, you're saying it's not the case either. So if somebody says, hey, do you want P or do you want Q, but you just don't like P and you don't like Q, you might say, um, I don't want either of those. It's not the case either of those that I want, right? So here, you're saying it's false either, which is just what we were saying. So that's another way of expressing neither nor and FOL. All right, so you might be tempted to try to express neither nor or neither P nor Q this way in FOL. All Not the case, both P and Q. And I think some of the reasons why students find themselves tempted to express that um, neither nor this way is because they're making the false assumption that the negation uh, can distribute uh, like the minus sign does in mathematics. So sometimes the minus sign in mathematics when put out in front of parentheses can distribute to the content that's inside of it. So you're imagining, hey, we can just distribute the negation here and just uh, distribute it here and then we just end up with the very same sentence here. But that's not how it works in FOL. It's not perfectly analogous to mathematics in that way. So if we think about um, this sentence, it's true in only one case. It's true in the case when uh, P is false And when Q is false, that's when neither nor. That's when when you say both, it's not the case P, and it's not the case Q. You're saying both P and Q are false. P is false and Q is false. Um, so in any other case, any other combination, um, this sentence will return false instead of true out, right? But when we think about this sentence, what it says is it's not the case both of those are true. So one case in which um, this sentence ends up being true 
is when the P is true but the Q is false. That's going to make this sentence false. So, in another case in which this sentence is true is when Q is false. I'm sorry, when P is false and Q is true. But again, that's going to make this sentence false, whereas it's true here. Um, although they do share in common that it'll be true when both P is false and Q is false. But since they differ in their truth conditions, there's cases in which one will be true and the other one is false, they can't mean the same thing. So this would be an incorrect way of trying to express the neither nor, um, uh, a proposition of neither nor in English. All right, and that ends this video on the disjunction symbol and the semantics of it in FOL. I hope you found it useful. Thanks for watching.